Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, my name is Maung Yang Nguyen, and I'm a global product manager of the Mutagenesis portfolio at GenScript. Today, I'm honored to introduce uh, the three speakers in our session. The first speaker is Dr. Killian Henlong, who is a research fellow at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. He is an expert in mutant libraries and utilization of these mutant libraries for gene and cell therapy applications. Uh, today, he'll be talking about how library selected uh, AV variants can effectively translate to non-human primates in the spinal cord and cochlea. Our second speaker is Dr. Posu Huan. Uh, he is an assistant professor of bioengineering at Stanford University. His research interests focus on both computational and experimental aspects of protein engineering for the development of better protein molecules for a variety of applications, including immunotherapies. Today, he'll be presenting de novo design of a self-assembling superantigen, a potential cancer immunotherapy via controlled T-cell activation. Last but not least is our own GenScript scientist, Dr. Lu Men Yi. Her expertise is in synthetic biology, and she has been leading an R&D team in developing CRISPR-based non-viral DNA templates at GenScript for more than three years. The title of our talk today is Precise and efficient non-viral CRISPR, CRISPR gene editing solutions, where she'll be sharing how GenScript can efficiently manufacture single guide RNA and DNA payloads for precise uh, CAR T, uh, uh, precise CAR and TCR knock-ins in T cells, a capability that lends a step forward to efficiently and pre uh, precisely engineer T cells. Before I hand the floor off to our first speaker, Dr. Killian Hanlong, who will be presenting his work around utilization of mutant libraries to generate novel AV variants with high levels of transduction, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce a class of mutant libraries offered by GenScript called Precision Mutant Libraries. These libraries enable more efficient and smarter engineering of proteins, uh, whether the protein of interest is an antibody, enzyme, or a viral capsid protein. So protein engineering has been around for a long time. Uh, there are numerous approaches available and utilized uh, depending on individual goals to be achieved. To name a few, site-directed mutagenesis, alanine scanning, or error-prone PCR, and degenerate codons uh, can be used to generate a library of mutants. However, these traditional approaches present some disadvantages when compared to precision mutant libraries. So what are really precision mutant libraries? Uh, precision mutant libraries are high quality diverse synthetic libraries uh, consisting of only desired mutants. These libraries offer even distribution of codons or specific distribution that is defined by the user, inclusion of user-defined codons, elimination of stop or unwanted codons, and codon optimization for a specific host of interest for enhanced expression. None of these qualities are available with libraries constructed through traditional approaches. There are three types of uh, precision libraries that we currently offer, site saturation, saturation scanning, and combinatorial mutagenesis libraries. In all three types of libraries, customers can actually request not to include the wild type amino acids in their, in their libraries. We build these libraries by synthesizing individual oligos carrying specific mutations and assemble them onto double-stranded DNA fragments or clone them into a plasmid of customer choice. So there is a very little chance of introducing mutations in the, back, uh, in the vector backbone. Uh, SR capabilities not only lie in the synthesis, but also in the assembly and uh, cloning, the library diversity doesn't get compromised going from PCR format to clone format. This is why we can provide a guarantee of uh, a minimum coverage of 90%, unlike our competitors. Our error rate is also very low. It's one in 3,000 base pair. We can also do NGS as part of our QC upon customer request. So if you need help with uh, Mutant Library Services, please visit our website or feel free to email me at mount.win at genscript.com. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Now let's welcome our first speak, uh, speaker, Dr. Killian Henlong, and learn about his exciting work on application of mutant libraries for AAV engineering. Dr. Henlong, the floor is yours. Thanks, Wynn. And hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. 
Um, so as Wynne said, today I'm going to talk to you about um, a library platform we developed in the Maguire Lab, and specifically how two variants selected from that platform have translated from mice into non-human primates in the spinal cord, as well as the cochlea. So first, my disclosures. Um, so at this point of the conference, I probably don't need to go into too much detail on what AAV is. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with libraries, um, specifically the insertional capsid libraries we use, um, with a library approach, instead of uh, transgene cassette like GFP that you have here, um, uh, a library carries its own viral capsid protein, which includes in it uh, a random 21, in our case, a random 21 base insert corresponding to seven amino acids uh, in the variable region eight of the of the AAV capsid. And you can see that those little pink purple marks indicating where that is there. Um, so with a with a library, the standard approach is that you would produce a cocktail of millions or billions of these variants, introduce them to your uh, tissue or organ of interest, and then harvest from that. Uh, I suppose, variants that successfully got into that uh, tissue and rinse and repeat until you condense your library into candidate variants. However, sometimes with, with this library approach, you inadvertently select for capsids that are dead on arrival, that don't actually translate into anything that works. And we wanted to sort of minimize the chances, to maximize the chances that whatever we produced um, was highly functional. And in thinking about that, um, AAV transduction is actually, it's a multi-step process, of course. Um, first, you have to get to the right organ, then you have to get to the right cell, you have to get inside that cell, um, you have to reach the nucleus, and then you have to finish uncoding, et cetera, and drive transgene expression. And the traditional library approach doesn't necessarily differentiate between all of these steps, between um, capsids, between variants that are in the nucleus or in the cell, or sometimes even on the cell. And so we sought to select for, um, for variants at this last step, at the level of transgene expression. And that's where we came up with our platform, iTransduce. So with iTransduce, as well as the standard library setup that I described earlier, we also incorporate into the cassette Cree. And the premise behind this is that we can inject this uh, Cree-containing library into a transgenic mouse containing a flock-stopped um, fluorescent reporter such that in cells um, that don't get any vector or in cells that only get dud vectors, you don't get any TD tomato expression in this case. But in functionally transducing variants, um, you do. And so with that, you can then flow sort out your um, TD tomato positive cells from your tissue of interest, from your organ of interest, with the hope that the vectors you draw from that, uh, with the hope that they will be uh, transduction competent. And so that's our general approach. We inject our mouse with this cocktail. Um, we harvest TD tomato positive cells. Uh, we PCR out viral DNA from those uh, flow sorted cells. We use low coverage NGS just to check at each, at each stage of the selection whether, whether we've condensed the library to a sufficient state. And if not, we rinse and repeat to do a new, uh, to do a new round. So just as, as an example of this, um, the first main test we did with this library, um, as many others have tried and continue to, and continue to do, we um, wanted to derive a variant that could successfully bypass the blood-brain barrier and transduce the brain after intravenous administration. So that's what we did. We took our transduce library and injected them into flock stop TD tomato mice um, on a C57 background and uh, proceeded as I said. For the first round of selection, we just used a traditional library method. We didn't utilize the Cree functionality just to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff to get rid of the vectors we know are going to be are going to be duds just by chance. And then the second round, we used this Cree expression. And while the first round featured thousands upon thousands of visible variants after the first or after the traditional selection, after our one round of iTrans use selection. Uh, more than three quarters of all of the sequences we saw with NGS were represented by just two variants, which we called AVS and AVF. Obviously, we were really excited when we saw this. So the first thing we did was we took these new variants and we vectorized them and we um, uh, encapsulated a GFP cassette in that and tested them intravenously in mice. 
And as, as comparisons for that, we looked at AV9, which was the parent capsid, as well as PHBB, a highly effective uh, variant that had been selected using uh, advanced libraries uh, setup. And what we saw was that AVS, uh, which was the more popular variant in our screen, actually didn't improve upon AV9 and its ability to transduce the brain intravenously. However, AVF really, really did. We saw really high levels of expression, wide distribution. Um, we checked in multiple mouse models, and um, not models, rather strains, and there was, seemed to be no effect of, of on strain, of strain on effectiveness. Um, we also saw very high expression when we injected intrathecally into mice. AVS, as you saw, didn't really cross the blood-brain barrier more, effect more efficiently than AV9, but the vector produced really well. And uh, when we looked at local expression, either in peripheral transduction here, you can see in the third column, um, or when we injected directly into the brain, uh, we saw very high, robust, consistent expression. And so we, you know, we didn't we didn't throw it away. We put it we put it to the side and decided to look at uh, decided to look at it later. And you'll see that now in a few minutes. But first, I um, I'll move on to AVF. So, as you'd expect, the success of AVF made us want to see would this translate up to larger animals. And so we decided to look at cinemogus macaques. We performed a small pilot study, just uh, three monkeys injected with AVF and two injected in AV, with AV9 uh, intrathecally into the spinal cord and the L4, L5 part of the spinal cord. It was a uh, relatively low dose we administered. It was three to four by 10 to the 12 vector genomes of either capsid. Um, this was single-stranded AAV GFP. Um, and so we injected intrathecally and after three weeks, um, we euthanized the animals and took a look. What we saw was, in general terms, both vectors expressed quite well in the spinal cord. Um, both had similar um, patterns of expression in the times in the types of, in terms of the types of cells they transduce. Um, primarily, we see a lot of neurons. Um, you see this co-labeled neurofilament marker, astrocytes as well, co-labeled with GFAP, and then. We saw rare instances of microglia as indicated by IVA1 and uh, oligodendrocytes as indicated with the ALIC2 antibody. Um, but overall, we saw wide expression across um, the length of the spinal cord. And looking using DAB staining, um, we did counts of this. And we saw that in general, the, as expected, the expression was concentrated in the lumbar region of the spinal cord where the, where the injection was performed. Um, and with and with this, about sixty eight percent of interneurons and motor neurons were transduced by AVF. Uh, with and that sort of that's uh, I suppose went down in a gradient with about forty two percent in the thoracic region, thirty nine percent at the in the cervical region. When we looked at numbers, and again, this is a pilot study, so it's 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 limited in in terms of n numbers and what you can really say. We did see a an upward trend. Um, of AVF in terms of both interneurons and motor neurons of the percentage of transduced cells, the percentage of GFP positive cells. Furthermore, when we looked at the actual intensity of DAB staining, um, we saw that AVF transduced cells had slightly higher, very slightly higher average intensity, indicating that perhaps AVF is um, driving stronger gene expression relative to AV9. To do all of this image analysis, we used uh, image analysis software called CTA, which, is, which we, uh, was developed by flagship biosciences and who we worked with and um, collaborated with on this uh, project. And this is a machine-guided algorithm. It uh, uses morphology and shape to um, detect different cell types and to make counts on them. At every step, this is guided uh, by pathologists and spot-checked for consistency to make sure um, everything is on the up and up. So again, as I said, we saw um, slightly higher levels of expression um, in AVF transduced spinal cords relative to AV9 with, in terms of interneurons and motor neurons. When we looked at the DRG, we actually saw the reverse. Uh, AVF transduced 
spinal uh, spinal cords had one and a half to twofold ish uh, lower levels of expression in DRG relative to AV9. And this might really be a good thing, as, as I'm sure many of you have attended talks um, at this ASGCT at previous conferences and read papers. DRG toxicity is something we see in non human primates when we inject, especially via this method, with AAV. And so it, we were quite happy to see that the see this lower level of expression because as you can see perhaps in the in the lumbar region the particularly there was um evidence of toxicity in the very highly transduced <clears throat> excuse me in the very highly transduced uh cells as indicated by their um abnormal morphologies as well as drgs one um interesting and i suppose slightly unexpected finding was when we looked um in the sciatic nerve we saw evidence of Schwann cell transduction. Um, this isn't something we've seen before with AVF, it's certainly not something we've seen with AV9, or obviously not with AVF, but it's certainly not something we've seen with AV9. Um, and so we were really pleased to see this. This was sort of unexpected boon for us. And especially given that this was a, a relatively low dose, it certainly bears further investigation. And we are looking forward to that. <laughs> What, what was interesting about all this is that even though in interneurons and motor neurons, we saw slightly higher AVF expression, um, when we looked using qPCR, we actually saw fewer genomes per cell in AVF treated samples versus AV9. And we saw this both in um, the spinal cord, all parts of the spinal cord, this uh, reduced trend, as well as in the peripheral organs we've looked at. Now, again, to underline that this is um, still a pilot study, there, in, there is uh, a, significant, a significant degree of variation in expression between different animals. Um, so certainly we need, to, we need to repeat this study with larger end numbers um, to get a real sense of, of, what the true, of what the true expression is. But it is, it is interesting that it seems like per, per AV genome accessing the accessing the cell, we get higher expression. Um, so to summarize this part, like we're 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 pretty pleased with this. Um, we see really good expression of AVF um, throughout the spinal cord. Um, it's very very comparable rates of expression uh, to other studies that have used self complementary AV9, including studies that that transduced at much higher doses. So as you can expect, we're proceeding to a uh, to perform a, a more expanded study on this now. So that's AVF. That was our um, what looked like it was going to be a success if you just looked at the mouse brains. What about AVS? So as I said, it didn't it didn't look um, excellent in the in the brain when administered intravenously, but it did show very high local transduction as well as the peripheral organs. So we were curious whether this would translate to the inner ear. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the anatomy of the inner ear with, with the cochlea itself, um, the sensory epithelium, the hair cells are the cells in the ear that obviously uh, sense sound. Um, transducing these and, and sort of the AV field in the ear has had a sort of, uh, something of an uphill battle. Um, while there are a number of serotypes that can efficiently translate inner hair, uh, transduce rather inner hair cells, um, it's been difficult to effectively transduce outer hair cells to a great degree, which represents 75 or 80 percent of hair cells in the cochlea. And so we looked with AVS. We started with mice. We started with neonates, um, injecting right at P1 with the same CBA EGFB construct I've been using throughout, the throughout this talk. Um, we injected through the round window membrane. As you can see in this diagram, there are a number of different routes of administration um, to the cochlea. We use the round windows. It's what we're most familiar with. And we injected um, three by 10 to the 10 vector genomes in roughly one microliter. And we took a look um, five days after injection. What we saw, we were really pleased. Uh, we saw very high levels of expression, in this case, in hair cells, in both inner and outer hair cells. Um, as you can see in the graph on the right, we, uh, the, our transduction resulted in 100% targeting effectively of inner hair cells and very robust, consistent targeting of outer hair cells as well. You can see this downward apex to base uh, gradient. This is very commonly seen in the inner ear. And is effectively what we expected to see. The apex is easier to transduce than the base. 
But it's, it wasn't just hair cells that we targeted. We also got very good, broad expression of multiple cell types throughout the, uh, the organ of Cordy, throughout the cochlea, um, including the lateral wall and spiral limbus, um, claudia cells, inner sulcus cells. These are, many of these cell types, although they don't actually sense sound, they're very important for um, upkeep of the ear, and they're implicated in deafnesses such as um, that relating to GJB2, um, which there are talks on this evening. Um, as well as these cells in the cochlea, we also looked at the vestibular system and saw in the utricle, as well as the saccule, um, these are vestibular hair cells, hair cells that effectively um, drive your sense of balance. We saw very good transduction throughout there as well. Now, obviously, there's always a concern about toxicity with this, so we tested uh, my hearing after administering this, and we found no difference between treated and untreated animals, even at a relatively high dose of AAV. So um, seeing this good gene expression throughout the cochlea, we wanted to see if this was um, relevant from a therapeutic point of view. And uh, to do that, we used a mouse model of Usher syndrome type 3A. Usher, uh, Usher 3A is, um, you see, it's a deafness blindness disease. The deafness aspect uh, develops more slowly than other forms of deafness, often only beginning in the end of the first decade or beginning of the second decade of life. Um, which offers a good window of opportunity for intervention. Um, we needed a mouse model that accurately mimicked that disease. When you just use a straight Claren-1 knockout, um, the gene implicated in USH3A, the mice are born deaf. Um, so to do that, the model we used uh, was a Claren-1 knockout that also expressed Claren-1 from an 801 promoter. 801 is a developmental gene that begins turning off at the end of development coming up to birth and is effectively at zero um, by about a week uh, postnatal. So we packaged a codon optimized Claren 1, uh, including both the five prime and three prime UTRs, which are essential for good um, transgene expression. We packaged this into, into AVS and we took a look. And what we see, and if you're unfamiliar with these kind of ABR and DPOAE plots, just know that um, in this graph lower is uh, is better. And you can see the black uh, wild type line indicating that. And what we found was, uh, as expected, the uninjected mice, the green lines here, um, at P35, they have some, resi some residual hearing, but mostly by P60, certainly by three months of age, they're completely deaf. And what we found when we treat with the treated mice was that in low and middle frequencies, we maintained wild type level hearing um, right up to five months, which is as far out as we took the study. And we also saw that with, as you can see below, with DPOAEs, which are a direct measure of outer hair cell function. So we're really pleased with this. And morphology reflected that as well. Looking at the hair bundles of the hair cells, we saw, if you, see, if you look on the right, by five months, um, most of the hair bundles are gone, and those that remain are quite ragged. Whereas in treated mice, um, we see really good morphology and high level, uh, high cell numbers. So at this point, we were really pleased. This is, it looks like um, an excellent preclinical candidate in mice, certainly. So the question becomes then, will this translate up to non-human primates? Excuse me. So we, again, we use, we use cinemologous monkeys for this, uh, for this study. We use Sinos. Uh, and we decided to test a couple of different doses, um, just in, again, a, a pilot study in a small number of years. Um, one ear got a very low dose, 8 by 10 to the 10 vector genomes. Uh, two ears got a higher dose, 4.7 by 10 to the 11 vector genomes. And then one other ear got a slightly higher dose again, along with a PBS injected control ear. And when we looked, we saw, if you look on the left at the high dose uh, treated sample, we saw very broad transduction throughout the organ of Cordy, and I'll zoom in on that in a sec. Uh, the lower dose, we didn't really see much in terms of hair cell transduction, um, which is what we're used to seeing. However, we did see good expression throughout the lateral wall, especially in the base. The 5.8 by 10 to the 11 vector genome cochlea, we whole mounted and we took a look, and you see really beautiful, robust expression throughout the cochlea. Zooming in on the uh, the organ of Cordy specifically, you can see on the left, um, hair cells are labeled with Myo7a and magenta there. And you see good transduction, both of hair cells um, as well as the surrounding um, system. And in the graph on the right, you can see 
almost complete transduction of inner hair cells. And up to the apex and middle of the cochlea, we see complete transduction of outer hair cells. And again, that gradient um, drops off as you get towards the base. But it wasn't just hair cells we transduced, looking at other cell types as we had in the um, mouse, the lateral wall, uh, Henson's and Claudius cells, sulcus cells, pillar cells, the spiral ligament, we got really broad, really good transduction um, in our higher dose groups, um, which we were really, really pleased with. So from that, we wanted again, as with the mice, to look for toxicity to see if everything was all right. And what we found, these ABRs are in reverse. So in these ones, uh, the higher up, the better. What we found was that in the low-dose cochlea and in one of the high-dose cochleas that we tested, uh, there was no difference in ABR before and after. The monkeys could hear just as well in those ears. However, in the other high-dose uh, ear that we tested, the monkey was completely deaf afterwards, which was unusual. We, we Obviously, we were concerned, so we took a look um, Histopathologically, we didn't see much. As you can see in this figure here, there are very minimal focal um, instances of immune infiltration in all treated groups. Uh, but when we looked, when we compared the, um, the two high-dose cochleas, the two 4.7 by 10 to the 11 uh, vector genome cochleas, we saw really no difference in terms of GFP expression, in terms of numbers of viable hair cells we could see um, with histology, so um, we're still. It, it remains. It remains to be seen exactly why um, what has caused this. Now, the the surgery for um, round window membrane injection in in sinos is a lot more invasive than in mice or indeed in humans. So it may be something to do with that, but it remains to be seen. As as I said, this is a pilot study in injecting more mice or more. Um, primates and really getting a sense of, of, of dose and what is a safe dose to administer um, will give us, I suppose, a better idea of what's going on. Um, but yeah, so to summarize that, AVS, despite having, I suppose, a false start, a slow start in the brain, um, really, really is excellent in both the mouse and non-human primate cochlea, in the synocochlea anyway. Um, we saw really broad expression across um, the vast majority of cell types in the in the organ of Cordy, in the cochlea. And, um, and in our USH3A model, we saw really good, uh, robust protection that lasted out to five months. So um, overall, uh, we feel that the these variants produced by the iTransfuse system have been highly effective, and we're pursuing them now in more large animal studies and looking at um, looking at preclinical um, disease models as well. So after all of that, all that remains for me is to thank um, a lot of people, um, more than certainly around the slides. Um, obviously, the uh, iTransfuse um, platform and everything with AVF I've been working with I've been working with the McGuire lab for three years now and all of the inner ear work has been a collaboration between McGuire lab and David Corey particular shout out to Marina Ivanchenko whose name is in gold because um, none of the AVS work would have been possible without her um, I'd also like to thank the organizers HGCT and also Genscript for giving me the opportunity to tell you about this work um, and so all that remains for me is to thank you as well for listening. Uh, I'll be around for the Q&A session later if you want to ask me any questions. And I will pass on to the next speaker, Dr. Posu Huang. Thank you. Actually, Kellyanne, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. That was a great presentation. So we're going to do Q&A uh, after each talk. Uh, so oh, that, OK, sorry. Yeah, so that uh, the audience, some of the audience, if they want to catch other uh, uh, you know, presentations, they could. So uh, we've got actually quite a few questions. <laughs> the first question is, did you see GFP toxicity in the monkey? Um, I presume they're uh, talking about the AVF uh, monkeys. We saw mild toxicity in the DRGs, in specifically in um, very highly transduced cells. We, um, we saw abnormal morphology, but that's, that's the limit of what we saw. Okay, and then the second question is, how do you ensure that each, oh, it's, 
it's disappearing for some reason. Um, do you have a proposed explanation for why AAVS was so highly expressed after you after your pre-base selection round, despite not officially crossing the blood uh, blood brain barrier mm. when administered as a single vector? Uh, so it's it's an interesting question. Um, in part, it's certainly uh, uh, one factor. Certainly has to be that AVS produces very well as a vector. Um, but it is it is an interesting question. We uh, obviously it is very effective when you inject directly um, into the brain. But um, I don't think we're I don't think it's entirely clear why it was why it was so populous after the. Um, after the initial selection, it may be just that those cells that that um, cells that or rather uh, AVS capsids that did bypass the blood-brain barrier led to very high levels of gene expression in the brain, and so were picked up in that in the TD tomato screen. Okay, and then another question is: How do you envision gene therapy for adult patients with USH? Uh, for Usher syndrome, yeah. Syndrome as, yeah. Um, so for this for this form of Usher uh, for Usher syndrome, I think the intention would be uh, in an ideal world, intervening in patients uh, before there is a significant amount of of hearing loss. Uh, with something like this, once the hair cells are gone, this this gene therapy certainly won't bring them back. Uh, but Usher three A does have the advantage that you do have that window of intervention, where you could arrest hopefully gene, um, hearing loss and you know, that in, again, ideally will, will last lifelong. Okay, so we'll do one more question and then uh, uh, for the time being, we have to move on to uh, Dr. Fosu Huan's uh, presentation. So this last question, uh, Dr. Eric Zin here, were you able to detect AVS in other organs after systematic injection? And did you compare AVS and F against PHP, I think the other variants in yeah, the Yeah, PHPB ear. and PHPEV yeah, and I in the, in the ear. Yeah. And do they fall short of OHC transduction in comparison? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So um, when we looked in other organs after, uh, when we looked uh, for AVS, we didn't inject into non-human primates systemically. We just injected into, um, into the ear. And we didn't really see much in terms of peripheral expression. Uh, comparing AVS to other variants in the ear, uh, we've previously published work on PHPB, and they show similar transduction profiles, some differences. Um, PHPB appears to transduce um, neurons better, if I recall, and, and AVS, I think, transduces some kinds of supporting cells better, although I'd have to, I'd have to check again. Um, AVS does appear to, in, in certainly in this study, uh, transduced outer hair cells a little bit less well than, than PHPB did in our previous work. Um, in the base, certainly in the apex and the, the, the middle of the cochlea, it, it expressed just as well in that it got near complete transduction. But uh, again, this is a small study. We do want to expand the number of animals we transduce and look at a range of doses just to get a better sense of what those transduction levels really are. All right, so thank you very much. Thank uh, you Dr. all Kaley so and much Long. and thanks, Wynne. And now uh, let's move on to uh, Dr. Posu Wan's presentation. I'm very excited to share with you today a project that we've been working on for the last few years on the de novo design of a self-assembling superimaging. What we were trying to achieve is to build molecular logic through proteins and use the proteins to achieve control activation of T cells. The story really uh, began with the technology for building these de novo structures shown here are the crystal structure available in 2016 uh, that uh, when, when we wrote a review on the subject, very few of them actually had function. We're hoping that this ever expanding set of protein tools can potentially contribute to the solutions of uh, biomedical challenges. When we started thinking about the challenging issues in the various forms of cancer immunotherapy, we came across the adopted immunotherapy. This uh, refers to the various forms of T-cell-based cellular therapy either through um, biopsy to harvest the tumor infiltrating and lymphocytes, the TILs, or uh, going through the ex vivo extraction of T cells and uh, to, to program them 
uh, with novel receptors for targeting and activation, or you can uh, swap out the receptors with TCRs to specifically target neoantigens. When we look at these different modalities for cancer and neurotherapy, we're really intrigued uh, by the problems associated with the transductive T cells, the uh, TCRTs and uh, CAR Ts. We're uh, also really uh, amazed by how effective therapeutics like the TILs uh, can potentially be. So, uh, particularly uh, for these TILs, these uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, are, they are harvested in an exhaustive state, but are able to be expanded and reactivated to achieve a suppression of tumor growth when delivered back into the patient's body. The holy grail will be to see if we can deliver, uh, directly activate these uh, T cells at the tumor site within the body. Because these T cells are already in your body, perhaps it's not necessary to extract them in order to activate this function. Uh, it's very attractive to try to come up with a strategy that can directly activate them. Also, uh, if we can achieve this through the delivery of proteins, we can uh, drastically reduce the cost without having to go through the ex vivo extraction and reprogramming uh, process. So in order to do this, we ask ourselves uh, whether it is possible to borrow from biology, particularly the uh, mechanism for immune uh, surveillance. By uh, the natural process of T cell activation, which is normally through uh, the antigen presenting cells, we can activate T cells without necessarily having to harvest them and reprogram them since the uh, cool receptor signals are already part of the APC surface. So ideally what you would want to achieve is to create a localized uh, tertiary lymphoid structure. These tertiary lymphoid structures have been implicated in recent years with significant effects on cancer immunotherapy outcome. Uh, essentially these are structures of B cell, dendritic cells um, with various type of antigen presenting cells clustering uh, within the tumor environment to provide activation signal to trigger the proliferation and differentiation of uh, T cells. So ideally, what you have to do is to create a three-pronged approach to induce this type of tertiary link to the structure by cross-linking the three different types of cells, the tumor cells, the APC, and the T cells. This, is, can, this can probably be achieved by a tri-specific molecule, but in order to achieve this efficacy without serious toxicity, we think a, a molecular on and off switch would be necessary. So, uh, if we look at how T cells are activated naturally, as this text, uh, textbook example shows, the T cells are activated through the interaction of uh, T cell receptors with the MAC2 molecule that is uh, on the surface of an antigen presenting cell through an antigen uh, specific uh, interaction. It turns out that natural nature also produces uh, this group of proteins called superantigens. The superantigens are essentially just molecular glues that uh, force the formation of uh, the immune synapse uh, across these, uh, these receptors. What is really interesting here is that since superantigens can achieve T cell activation without the epitope uh, specificity, you can potentially use it to activate T cells as a potential cancer immunotherapy. Superantigens are very potent because the cross-linking is through an invariant region of the B beta chain of the TCR and the alpha one chain of the MAC2. Uh, they can rarely activate T cell, the CD4 and CD8 T cells, as well as memory cells. One example, of this type of superintendent is uh, this molecule MAM, uh, M -A -M, uh, shown here in the, in the ternary structure complex with TCR and MAC2. Because it's such an elegant and potent way to uh, use proteins to activate T cells, we can readily take advantage of this uh, mechanism. But of course, there are some issues that we have to overcome. You don't necessarily want to use the superintendents on your own as these molecules evolve, are evolved to trigger immune responses. Uh, we will have to get around the immunogenicity and the, the toxicity issues uh, with these uh, proteins on the own. So um, one strategy to potentially overcoming this problem is potentially to create this uh, tri-specific molecule through uh, breaking up of the superintendent to multiple pieces. You can potentially couple one piece 
to the targeting element through the surface markers. Uh, you can recognize cancer cells through the uh, surface markers and you can have um, a logic end gate that is built into these two component super engines. So what uh, might this uh, type of design potentially look like? Um, now the different chains are shown in different colors. So uh, the yellow color, the single chain NAM uh, super engine is shown on the left. And when you split it into two different chains, you would uh, uh, need to have a molecular hub uh, to bring the components back together. The TCR is uh, our uh, TCR binding interfaces between these two domains. So you, the molecular hub would have to precisely position these uh, two domains so to, to activate these uh, T, -cell, T cells. So just to give you an, a little bit of a background on this idea of using supernagents to target cancer, this idea is not new. It has been uh, tried before. In this strategy, uh, they essentially took the supernagent SEA and connected to an antibody that targets colon carcinoma in this particular application. In the presence of this fusion protein, is shown that you actually need those uh, T cells and monocytes together in order to achieve the reduction in, in tumor growth. If you have T cells and monocytes alone, uh, even in the presence of the supernatural, it does not work. So um, overall, uh, this strategy seems to work, but it's a bit too toxic. So uh, they introduce a mutation to abolish the binding to the MAC, uh, MAC2. So, uh, uh, effectively to remove the interface uh, uh, to, the, to the APC. By doing so, it's expected that the toxicity will be managed, but uh, it does not resolve the issue with pre-existing immunity against SCA. Uh, this format, by the way, is reminiscent of what we now call uh, biospecific antibody. It's, it's cross-linking the same type of cells. So these molecules essentially failed uh, in clinical trials, not because they don't work. Uh, patients do respond to this type of uh, therapeutics, but they failed at the uh, goal of the clinical trials because there are pre-existing immunity against the, the SEA uh, superintendent. It was estimated that the general pop in the general publication pub population, the pre-existing immunity against SEA is roughly around 60% to 80%. This really reduced the therapeutic index for using this type of molecule. And also because the superintendents are very potent uh, toxins, the high level of toxicity require that uh, the dosing uh, regimens be very low. But because of that, uh, they can really overcome the pre-existing antibodies in the body. It is difficult to overcome pre-existing immunity against superintendents. But unlike SEAs, um, MAM, uh, has far your lower rate of pre-existing immunity, estimated to be about 20% of the population compared to the 60 to 80% of uh, SEA. So now uh, we ask this question, with modern protein design technology, can we actually build uh, a molecular on and off switch to control the vocalized uh, activation of T cells and solving this problem of uh, toxicity and off target effects? We can potentially achieve this by uh, using the two component strategy I already described. What we want to do here is to create a, a regimen where you have two steps. The first step, you wanna uh, recognize the surface markers on the tumor cells and uh, cross-link it with the antigen presenting cells. And this molecule should be uh, completely inert because it cannot activate these cells. You can then uh, have a temporal control by delaying the delivery of a, of a second component until the off-target uh, binding uh, subsides. So a second kill signal can then be uh, delivered to reconstitute the super engine functionality. Now the uh, TCR binding interface is formed and uh, the TCLs can, can now engage and, and activate. Uh, this would bring the rest of the immune system to eradicate the, the tumor cells. So um, another safety uh, feature is to have an off switch through which uh, the, uh, the molecular hub can be disrupted by uh, potentially uh, competitors uh, for, for these interfaces to turn the signal off. The de design challenges that a, a protein designer would have to face uh, is to figure out solutions to these two requirements. One is that we will have to have a molecular hub 
that is really highly specific so that you would uh, not cross react with other uh, proteins in, bi in, in the biological system. And the second is um, to have these self-assembling superantigens coming together, uh, but somehow still control the conformation of the components to make sure that the function, the superantigen function can be reconstituted. So um, for this molecular hub, the solution actually came from this design we've done a number of years ago. We realized that we can use this four-fold symmetrical tin barrel structure as shown here as a, as a molecular hub. Tin barrel is a structure with eight um, beta strands in the middle and eight VCs on the outside, forming this donut-shaped structure. The significance of this fold is that it is the most widely used enzyme fold in nature, but in this context, we can make, a make this a scaffold to host the uh, superintendent components. So as I mentioned, that these uh, tin barrels are made out of eight, bit, uh, eight strands and eight helices. What is unique about this is that uh, because it's perfectly symmetrical, you can slice it in half. And these uh, half constructs uh, would expose the edge strands in a very unique angle. So these beta strands are tilted counterclockwise about 35 degrees off of the, the central Z axis. So to satisfy the contacts, you would require that the partner has the exact same complementary shape. So if they're folded correctly, they can only interact with themselves. It turns out that the uh, smallest unit you can build is this quarter unit. They uh, self-assemble to form the full barrel on their own with weak uh, affinity. But when you uh, mix them with the three quarter uh, barrel, you can actually uh, purify these com uh, components independently. And, and uh, when you mix them, you will assemble into this full barrel. Because it's such a convenient symmetry to use, you can really slice and dice it in many ways. You can make a half split, uh, three quarter, one quarter split. And even just by moving a strand from one side to the other, you can create a, hero, uh, a three eighths, five eighths split heterobine. So these potentially are very good uh, uh, molecular hubs to bring the super uh, antigen uh, components together. But how do we actually uh, make this, this fusion? Um, the design, the idea, the design idea is relatively simple, but the process of engineering is actually very involved. Since the tin barrel is a donut shaped structure, the N and C terminus, termini uh, ended up being very close to each other. We can now use the N terminal half of the man. Uh, uh, super antigen to attach to the end terminal of the uh, timber and the C terminal domain to the other end of the, of, the, of, the, of the construct to create this fully integrated molecule. Uh, we have to um, bring out almost every protein design strategy that we know about to make sure that these uh, uh, fusion junctions are fully integrated and fully positioned uh, to, to maintain the super antigen structure. So the, um, as I mentioned before, the T-cell receptor binding interface uh, requires these, both of these domains uh, positioned co correctly. If, you, if this uh, geometry is not achieved, uh, T-cell cannot be activated in this manner. So uh, we initially uh, tested 16 designs and recover three functional superagents only. So this highlights the critical aspect of the protein engineering process. Uh, and in order to assess the, the quality of this engineering, we used uh, T cell activation uh, assays to, to uh, make sure that the, the fusion is done correctly. So once we've made these molecules, we want to see if they're folded and stable. In these uh, circular dichroism, dichroism experiments, uh, which are uh, uh, measurements that you can make to monitor the presence of secondary structure, we see that the protein is stable but does not show a co cooperative uh, similar transition in the temperature experiment. The protein is constrained with disulfides and is expected not to fully unfold, but it appears that uh, when you reduce the temperature back down to, to room temperature from, from uh, 100 degrees, you uh, um, attain partial refolding of the structure. We think that is because of one of the, one of the um, uh, super energy domains cannot fully renature. And that's what um, is causing this observation. So, and in terms of the preservation of the super energy functionality, uh, we now uh, try it with this uh, T cell activation assay by co-incubating human PBMCs 
with the proteins and monitor the secretion of IL-2 um, in different concentrations. So as, as you can see here on the right, uh, the shaded bars are uh, activation profiles of uh, uh, wild type uh, MAM in different concentrations. And the black bars are uh, for the design of the fusion construct that we produced. As you can see that we can achieve activation and the level of IL production induced by the design is even higher than the wild type super engine. Um, this is for reasons that we uh, don't uh, fully understood yet. On the bottom panel are the various control that are uh, showing uh, uh, that the design construct is indeed responsible for the activation signal. So these are just various dropouts and, and uh, positive control with uh, CD3. So the bigger question now is whether we can achieve the same functionality when we make the design as two components. So uh, these uh, tin barrel structure, as I uh, mentioned before, can be easily split into these different uh, species. So when you produce it as a half constructs, uh, these are still homodimer and still preserves the homodimer uh, interfaces. So when we mix these components together, you see these three different peaks uh, with, the, with the middle one corresponding to the target uh, uh, active super engine. But when we uh, test the uh, T cell activation with these uh, with the, these molecules, it turns out that the the green bar, uh, which corresponds to the the activation signal of each of the species, the green bar uh, still retains the highest uh, activation level, which is the, the desired outcome. But we don't necessarily want to allow the components to form homodimers on their own, so we uh, further uh, uh, design these uh, heterodimeric split uh, version of the construct. In, uh, on the, in the picture here, just to uh, uh, remind you that this is a binding modality of the superintendent, the N-terminal domain, the longer oval, uh, is, is in contact with MAC2. So we will expect any of the components that carry these long over oval um, uh, uh, portion will be able to bind to B cells. And indeed, when we do the binding assay, using the, the spinocytes from uh, Bob's mouse, the, uh, the, the green and the blue curves uh, overlap uh, with, on the B cell binding signal. The T cell binding signal is a little bit harder to interpret, but, but when we uh, look at the IL-2 activation, indeed, again, uh, now this uh, green targeted self-assembled structure is still uh, providing the highest level of activation. But you might notice that the activation concentration uh, for this particular construct uh, appears to be uh, appear to require tenfold higher uh, concentration, and I think uh, this is uh, related to the to the interface because we know that the the half splits are the tightest uh, interface that we can make. But when you uh, make these heterodimer uh, splits, uh, the affinity seems to correlate with the with the IO two activation. But, but regardless, uh, we want to see if the, the heterodimeric splits can uh, be used to um, uh, activate and kill tumor cells. So uh, as, a, as a test, we use this um, fusion. We build this fusion with uh, pertuzumab, uh, which is an anti-HER2 antibody. We're using the single chain, uh, uh, the uh, version of it. And this is just to show you that when, when you expose these proteins to the uh, HER2 plus cell lines, uh, the findings mainly um, uh, just coming from the, the pertuzumab fusion. And when we subjected these designs, uh, this is only done on the N-terminal side as the first targeting component. We send them to um, the, the protocol that we expected to uh, use this, this type of uh, self-assembling toxin, which is uh, to have a first component being introduced and then uh, allow it to be incubated for a while before you introduce the, the second component. And we want to see if uh, going through this, this type of process will still allow the uh, super engine to uh, localize on the surface of the cancer cells and uh, also have the self-assembling um, uh, capability to, to uh, have the functional uh, super engine from, uh, T cell act activation. So when we uh, go through this process, we continuously monitor the GFP expression of the cell line. So this is very, very preliminary, but it's really, really exciting uh, for us, is that um, this cell line expresses the GFP 
uh, so we can monitor its growth and it's expressing also uh, HER2 for the targeting using Kutuzumab. And as you can see here, that uh, the three curves uh, using the, the components of this uh, self-assembling superengine, uh, both the, the targeting antibody or the N or the C components by themselves do not affect the uh, tumor cell growth. But when you uh, mix these two components in this sequential fashion, as uh, we expect to, to uh, uh, deliver it, uh, you actually achieve uh, suppression of tumor growth. So this is, uh, is very, very interesting. And uh, just in summary, I would uh, like to uh, you know, tell you that uh, essentially what I showed today is uh, to uh, tell you that we successfully designed this fully integrated uh, uh, de novo superantigen. And this self-assembly allows us to reconstitute the superantigen function. And additionally, with the targeting components, we show that these uh, cells can actually suppress, at least these proteins can actually suppress uh, tumor growth. So uh, there are some ongoing work that we're uh, conducting right now. We're delivering these proteins directly in vivo into uh, mice. Uh, this experiment is uh, in progress, but currently uh, we don't see any uh, adverse effects on the mice so far. Uh, they're not losing weight, they're not having fevers or anything. So it seems like uh, potentially our molecule is not uh, very toxic uh, to mice. And we were working towards uh, animal tumor models. And one thing uh, in particular is that this uh, superengine lamb uh, can function cross species. So uh, we can potentially choose syngenic uh, mouse models when we, if we choose to do so in the future. So. Um, with this, uh, I will have to thank my very talented graduate student. Uh, this entire project is mostly driven by Andreas uh, over the last few years with uh, the help of Haotian um, making some of the heterodimeric splits. And this project is also conducted in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Jennifer Cochran's and uh, Ed Engelman's labs. Um, they're, they're, uh, people from the lab uh, help uh, conduct some of the experiments I showed today. And here are the, the funding support um, that we've received. And, and I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, cooperation with uh, Professor Jennifer Conklin uh, at Ingram Labs. Um, the people from the lab and uh, the Hi, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back. And uh, we would like to thank Dr. Fosu Huan uh, for his fascinating uh, immunotherapy uh, platform uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Fosu Huan will be back uh, for a QA section after the third uh, presentation. So we're right now we're just going to uh, go into uh, live. Uh, right now we're just going to go into our third presentation. for joining our talk on discussing how CRISPR, especially Cas9 nuclease, chemically synthesized single guide RNA and a single strand DNA DNA HDR templates can be used together to generate cell therapeutics via non-viral protocol, which can be further developed into an alternative solution to produce allogenic cell therapeutics in a more secure and economic way. Hemoric antigen receptor T cells are a promising treatment for certain types of cancers. And since 2017, there have been four CAR T therapeutics approved by FDA. Meanwhile, cell therapeutics are still constantly evolving and improving and providing new options for cancer patients. Cell therapies are currently being evaluated in a variety of cancer types in clinical trials all thanks to the continuous development of gene editing tools. There are several types of tools available for gene editing, and their invention all started in the realization that the introduction of double strand DNA break at the target site may result in a several magnitude increase of frequency of target gene integration. However, the meganuclease uh, approach was restricted by the lack of flexibility and the recognition site. Later on, there are also zinc finger nuclease and the transcription activator like effector nuclease talon 
successively increase the genome editing efficiency. However, targeting different sites in the genome require redesign and the re-engineering of a new set of proteins. The difficulty in cloning and protein engineering of zinc finger nuclease and talon partially prevent these tools from being broadly adopted by scientific communities. In this respect, CRISPR has indeed accelerated the field because it's very robust and much simpler and more flexible to use. Because the CasNet protein is, uh, is stable and whenever we need to change a new target, we just need to redesign a 20 base pair guide RNA sequence and send it to chemical synthesis. And it's very easy and uh, simple to use. Therefore, CRISPR tools have, have been widely used in different uh, research fields from basic genetic research to gene therapy, cell therapy, which we'll talk a little bit more later in the talk, and also to cell line engineering and animal model generation, agriculture, target screening and epigenetic research, and also, uh, which were also very important in 2020 with the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, fast and portable detect tools by, based on, on CRISPR also showed a great power to prevent the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. Also because the wide use of this uh, CRISPR tool, the inventor Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dotna received a Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year. Also, um, CRISPR has been used to generate cell therapeutics for uh, clinical use and nowadays. This table from the 2020 article entitled Gene Editing Pipeline Takes Off in Nature Review this is 12 allogenic therapeutics that are in or approaching the clinical trial. There's one engineered by micronuclease, which we mentioned before, five by Talon, and six already by CRISPR-Cas system. Notably, the number four candidate, its performance in phase one clinical trial was already published in last February and proved the safety of CRISPR-engineered T-cell therapies. However, when we look at the process of this uh, NYSOT CRT engineering. For the generation of, uh, of this therapy, CRISPR was only applied to knock out the endogenous TCR gene and the PD1 components. The delivery of the payload NYSO was still done by lantivirus. Conventionally, we can also generate allogenic CAR T or TCR T cell by delivering an expression cassette of the payload first by viral methods, and then use the CRISPR to knock out certain endogenous targets, which may cause life-threatening graft versus host disease, like the gene encoding TCR and other targets like CD52 or B2M to enhance the persistence. But actually, by crispr cas system, the functional knockout of endogenous TCR and a site-specific knockout of in the site-specific knocking of payload can be achieved by one step and in a non-viral methods. When designing the CRSRP production process, one important factor that I need to consider is the availability of critical studying materials. Lantiviral gene transfer is the current golden standard for clinical manufacture of CAR T cells. High expression levels after random transgene integration are achieved by use of strong viral promoters. However, the excessive CAR expression may also lead to the activation induced cell death or exhaustion. On the other hand, for non-viral methods, it has also its advantages on precise gene editing and the entire production process is animal free and the much lower cost and the faster turnaround time because the entire process is simple and uh, there's no involvement of bacteria cell or mammalian cells. During the past two years, it still has its limitations due to the uh, relatively lower editing efficiency and also with limited vendor of GMP production. Um, but now it's become a more promising and uh, more popular in the field. To do the re 
replace the endogenous TCR with antigen-specific TCR in the car, first we need to design a special guide RNA to create double-strand DNA break at the first exome of TCR alpha constants, and then integrate the design constants at the double-strand break via homology direct repairing. In this way, TCR or car expression cassette can be placed under the control of indigenous transcription regulation, leading to a sustainable T cell function and delayed cell exhaustion. On the left side of this slide is a detailed design of how to uh, insert a NYESO TCR to the indigenous TCR to generate TCRT. But on the right side of the slide is a design how to replace indigenous TCR by well-designed anti-SYN19 car. To do the uh, T-cell engineering via non-viral protocol, we need a few key components. First of all is the guide RNA, and it needs to be mixed together with Cas9 protein to form uh, the active form of RNP. And we also need the HDR template to introduce the CAR or TCR constructs. Also, we need the isolated and activated T-cell. When the all the materials are ready, we mix them together and put on the electroporation platform and then do the cell expansion and recovery and to screening the pos positive population. To achieve high uh, editing efficiency, the choice of RMP materials is very important. Let's go back to the um, case of PD-1 knockout. Here are three different uh, published data. On the first one is was a clinical trial done a few years ago by a Chinese group. They delivered Cas9 guide RNA via plasmid templates. The expression of Cas9 protein and guide RNA were all done by in vivo transcription, and the average knockout of PDY is only about 10%. And back to the case that we mentioned before, that report in 2020. Uh, for the knockout of uh, PDL1, PD1 here, um, the guide RNA is actually produced by in vitro transcription, and uh, the knockout efficiency of PD1, PD1 is uh, averagely uh, in 20%. On the right side is the recent case published in the end of last year. It's actually also a Chinese therapeutic uh, company. They developed a, a new uh, cell therapy uh, by deactivating the indigenous PD-1, meanwhile knocking a anti 19 car at the PD-1 locus. In that study, the researchers used a highly purified single RNA, which is chemically synthesized, and uh, is actually purchased from GeneScript. The knockout efficiency of PD-1 is about 90%. The other important thing is to ensure the um, material for, no, for uh, knocking templates. We did some in-house tests to verify which is the best form for knocking templates than a hectonized T cell line. We choose a few different types of uh, payloads as represents like plasma DNA and mini circle to represent circular DNA payloads. And uh, PCR, purified PCR amplicon to represent the uh, blunt and linear double-strand DNA, and also a single-strand DNA. Two days after the operation, we found both plasma DNA and the PCR amplicon has much, quite high um, GF positive rates, but we also found a very high background with a non-RMP control group, which means this is actually transit expression of the construct. When we look at the SSDNA group, the um, JF positive rate is pretty low, but there's also barely any uh, background in the non-RMP control group. When we wait till seven days after electro operation, we found out the, at the uh, circular DNA payloads group, the RMP positive samples has much, much dramatically decreased JF positive and almost equal to non-RMP uh, control group which means there's no uh, knocking ha events happened. When we'll look at the PCR DSDNA uh, group, the GFP positive rate maintains about, at about 20%, but 
and is much higher to the control group, which indicates there, there's actually uh, integration happened. For single strand DNA, the positive population doesn't change. And also in the RMP uh, control, non-RMP control group is still with very low backgrounds. So the conclusion here is linear DNA payloads templates have better performance than circular DNA templates for HDR. And at the same dosage, like two microgram, single strand DNA has lower knocking efficiency, but also lower false positive signals. In the end of 2019, there's also a research group published uh, work on, by using long range sequencing to evaluate different type of payloads like what we did. There are uh, PCR donors, which is linear, blunt, and uh, double strand DNA. Also single strand DNA donors and plasmid donors. By long, by long range sequencing, they found that um, by fact evaluation, they found that, um, like what we uh, just reported before, that PCR donor gives the highest GFP positive rate with like about 50%, while sing single strand DNA donor gives 20% 20, 20 um, GFP positive rate, and plasma DNA gives the lowest GFP positive rate. When look inside the, the constructs by long range sequencing, they found out um, besides the perfect HDR, insertion, there are also a high ratio of duplicate uh, IHEJ ligation happened when using blunt and PCR products. And also integration of uh, concatenate donors happens in the when using PCR amplicon as, as HDR repair templates. Well, for single strand DNA donor, there's a um, much higher ratio of perfect HDR, and there's any other, barely any other type of uh, random integrations. Well, however, there, there can be, or might be low ratio of truncated integration donor due to maybe the single strand DNA is not stable within the cell. And the case for plasma DNA donor is the worst. Uh, it's had much lower um, ratio of perfect HDR, but also have other risks of um, with the integration of extended plasma backbone. And here we also have some in-house testing on uh, DNA we purified from a PCR amplicon compared to single strand DNA donor um, on a um, T primary T cell from a Q a ALL patients. On, on this data, we found that um, double strand DNA will cause severe uh, so that's it, death due to toxicity via a dose manner, dose increase manner. Well, for single strand DNA, it, it can, with the increase of the dosage, the survivability maintained at a all very high level. And most importantly, when we look at the effects data and the four microgram dosage, there is no positive uh, population anymore because most of the cell died due to toxicity of double strand DNA. However, for single strand DNA, the knocking efficiency increased linearly with the dosage of SIDNA input. Also, by the very beginning of 2021, there's also another a research, German research group reported the toxicity of double strand DNA is actually uh, dependent on the dosage of transfected double strand DNA. It can trigger multiple autoimmune response which may lead to cell death or apoptosis. In this research, the authors also combine the DNA sensor inhibitor and also with HDI enhancer, which can um, give a very nice protocol for the cell preparation and uh, cell treatment electroporation program. In the end, by combining DNA sensor inhibitor and HDI enhancer, the now key efficiency of um, anti cd 19 car and the BCMA car can both increase from 20% to about 50%. The take home message is that um, T cell can be edited efficiently by non-viral methods. High quality chemical synthesis single RNA can provide high coding efficiency and low off target rates. Better knocking efficiency 
Salvability and integrity can be achieved by using single strand DNA payloads as repair templates and optimize electroporation protocols. And in the end, I would like to introduce um, GeneScript's CRISPR service supporting gene knocking, including the CRISPR sgRNA service and the single strand DNA service. For, for single RNA at GeneScript, we offer highly purified safe added sgRNA. It has minimal impact on cell viability and minimal off targets from truncated oligos, and it's one stop shop from CRISPR machinery to knocking templates. Here's some data to show the high purity of or highly purified single guide RNA. It has a purity more than 99% and there's no other uh, truncation fragments in the final product. Also, it has lower to cell toxicity compared to IVT prepared single guide RNA due to the lack of triphosphate at the final period. And also because it higher stability due to the uh, modification at both five period and three periods. And also it has very high editing efficiency and safety on primary T cell. As you can see here, um, with both um, Cas9 and Cas9 fused with EGFP protein, a different um, dosage from 7.5 picomole to 20 picomole, we can all reach um, better than 95% of the knockout efficiency and uh, high cell will be around 80%. Also, we also provide single strand DNA service for the HDR repairing templates. The single strand DNA we produce is done via what proprietary isothermal enzymatic production process. And also is produced by our in-house prepared high quality control study materials. The lens is available from 115 to 500 nanometer time long. And now we are glad to announce that it's up to milligram level delivery quantity, allowing for flexible study design and even to support preclinical studies. The DS DNA final product, single strand DNA final product is uh, sequence verified, both of the uh, DNA producing template also the final SSD product. And we also offer ultra pure grid for large scale single strand DNA. And it's animal free and nematoxin free. And we also offer free lifetime gene template storage supporting faster and more cost effective reorders. And in the end, I would like to say that we are the expert in gene synthesis with 18 years experience. And we can synthesize more difficult genes as uh, also more difficult single strand DNA designs. Also for larger, longer uh, designs and DNA payloads, we also offer minigram level linear stable DS DNA as knocking templates. In the end, I would like to say, let's work together to improve the efficient and the safety together. And thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, I would like to, um, I'm happy to answer. If you have any further questions, please visit our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lumen, uh, for her uh, very nice presentation. Uh, so we're going to do the uh, Q&A section right now for uh, Dr. Po Su Huan and uh, Dr. Uh, Lumen uh, Yi. But uh, Dr. Lumen Yi is in China, so uh, unfortunately she couldn't join us. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Claire Zhu is uh, going to uh, answer questions uh, that you guys have for her presentation. So let's welcome Dr. Uh, Claire Zhu uh, as well. So um, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Po Su Huan. Uh, we've got a few questions. Uh, so the first question is, uh, could this uh, antibody super antigen molecule potentially activate non-specific T cells without binding at cancer cells uh, uh, I guess AG, antigen, AG, or does the safety molecule only allow TCR super antigen binding once the antibody has bound the cancer cell? Yeah, that's a very good question. So that's the whole motivation behind our design. So the idea is to have this two component uh, system where the first component, because you, you understand that when you deliver these drugs, they would uh, uh, flow systemically in your, in your body. But the point is that the first component, you would uh, specifically label these, these uh, tumor cells 
and then you can literally just wait uh, until your background goes away. So you actually increase the specificity. So we're hoping that through this process, um, you can you can then uh, prevent this cross reactivity with other uh, parts of the the cells. But but it is true that one concern is potentially that you would uh, once you form this super agent, and if the tag the labeling tag falls off from, from where your original target is, that your activated T cell could potentially go around and, and uh, start interacting with, with the rest of your, your body. But um, the idea there, that's why um, we also try to build, build into this off switch. So in case that happens, you can uh, quickly turn off the super antigen and, and hopefully this would not cause any damage. So, so the main mode of functionality would still just be at the tumor site. So another question is, uh, what is the half-life of this de novo super antigen in the body? So uh, as I mentioned that we're actually doing this study right now, and, and uh, because of the molecular size, we estimated to, uh, it will probably behave like a, like a big cytokine. So, so the, the, the uh, lifetime should be uh, pretty low, but we don't have evidence yet because right now we're just collecting data in, in mice uh, and, and we, we haven't gotten the conclusion yet. But it is expected that it, the life will be short and then actually there might actually be an advantage because uh, for this type of foreign proteins, when you inject them, uh, you you actually want them to clear out of the system quickly enough so that the immune response don't uh, don't don't have a chance to to uh, form, but but then also again this is this is a reason why uh, I, I, we we're pursuing this two component system because if the if the uh, unbound species can actually be washed away very very quickly then you actually reduce the the background uh, uh, cross reactivity so so we're actually hoping that we're uh, we will just be uh, concentrating these molecules at the tumor site. When, when you deliver the first component. So then, so then uh, yeah, the second component will actually be, be uh, um, readily uh, activating these super antigens. Uh, we have one more question, uh, which is, uh, how do you generate these uh, heterodimers? Yeah, so, so these heterodimers, as I, I only very vaguely describing it as, as these uh, cutting of the, of the different strands and different sizes, but in, in uh, practice, what we do is that we also tune, once we make the cut, we also tune the sequences, and and this is where we use uh, GenScript's technology, the uh, Precision Mutant Library, because you can imagine that the interfaces actually would involve a lot of different positions, and that's uh, that's where we actually can uh, use a, a Precision Mutant Library to to specify what residues are going to which positions and and uh, make our library size manageable, and and this is. Um, uh, somewhat uh, unique in tying into our computational design platform because we can do computational design to say what residue should be allowed and try to build hydrogen bonding networks inside the, the interface. And, and uh, this, this is the kind of technology that we use to build these uh, heterodimers. Thank you very much, Dr. Fosuwan. Uh, so let's, uh, now let's move on to uh, Dr. Claire Su. For, uh, we have a couple of questions for her. Uh, uh, first question is, do you provide GMP-grade single-stranded DNA? Yes, so uh, currently we're providing basic GMP grade uh, single stranded DNA, and that's for supporting uh, IND enabling studies as well as early phase human clinical trials. And our full uh, GMP production facility for the single strand DNA is under construction right now, and we do wish to have that in around 2023. Thank you. Uh, and another question is in your study, did you compare different ways to deliver RMP delivery? RNP, RNP complex with electroporation, lipid nanoparticles, endosomalytic uh, peptides, et cetera. Which one works efficiently? It is a good question because uh, within our uh, labs, we do mostly electroporation. We also have done some uh, lipofactamine-based transductions for um, easier uh, to manipulate cell lines. But for uh, T cells specifically, we have been using different electroporation system and try to compare, you know, and find out what's the most optimal protocol. Um, so far, we haven't tried uh, nanoparticles or other methods yet. However, we do collaborate with uh, different labs across the world. World, and we have some um, 
positive data on delivering uh, single strand DNA with uh, different nanoparticles. And uh, we can share more of that data with you uh, later on after the talk. But overall, we see for T cells, electroporation has been more generally accepted in the field for ge um, generating you know, therapeutic T cells. So that's also the reason why we're more focused uh, in testing out the optimal condition for that method. Thank you. We have one more question for you. Uh, what is the purity of your single guide RNA by LCMS? By HPLC, it is essentially pure, but all, but we all know a lot of stuff buried in your major peak. Uh, so yeah, we, we can use HPL, HPM, uh, HPLC or a bell analyzer to test you know, the uh, components of the final single strand DNA we deliver. To ensure the purity, we also do a couple other things. So we first um, do uh, sequencing to ensure you know the sequence is 100% correct. There's no other uh, peaks mixed in the final deliverables. And at the same time, we also can do um, digestions using a single strand DNA specific enzyme, you know, because a lot of people are worried that there might be double stranded DNA mixed in the final single strand DNA product. So we do uh, check from different aspects along with, you know, purity testing. Also, we run a gel to ensure, you know, there's one single band in, on there. So we try to tackle that from different aspects and uh, to ensure purity. Thank you very much. Uh, so actually, this is all we have uh, uh, for now. And uh, I think we can just uh, end our session. And uh, we would like to thank all the presenters uh, and uh, contributors, organizers, and also Dr. Claire Su for uh, participation uh, uh, in answering Dr. Lumen's uh, presentation's questions. So um, yeah, so thank you very much again. And uh, you all have a great, uh, great day.